All the time. All the time. God is good. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. It's just wonderful to be in God's house today. Uh, what better place to be than where we are right now? Um, remember that if you are watching us on Facebook, or those of you that are watching us on Facebook, if you have a prayer request, be sure and go ahead and put it in the comments right now so that Deborah can get it written down for our prayer time. someone who cared, we care so deeply about, but we woke up and no power. Well, when you order chicken from Kroger's and they're up here, they don't have power either. So we, we had fun getting our chicken together, but we got it all together, got the food together. My battery must be dying. Got the food together and everything. It was so, thank you everyone who helped out and it was much appreciated and as usual, God blessed it and just made it just an overwhelming amount of food for them. They're probably still eating leftovers. <laughs> um, Great it was to stand beside the road as they passed. I cannot hear you, Mark. How, how great it was to stand beside the road as the funeral procession passed. It was. We actually went up to assist the side of the road where the flag was across the road and watched the funeral procession go uh, to, the, to the cemetery. And it was, it was just such a special feeling to be able to do that. suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, 
Get behind me, Satan. You are, stum you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man come into his kingdom. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Good morning. New batteries in all the mics now. Uh-oh. Including me. Oh. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a fun one here. My props out here. barely see them. Well, I'll hold them up. Actually, I want to talk the story about the woman at the well and the water. Jesus was leaving from Judea. He was on his way to Galilee. Well, on the way, he had to go through Samaria. There was a plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down at the well. It was around noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Come on, get my prop ready. Will you give me a drink? He was probably thirsty. He was nice and hot there. Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and we and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What the living water is, is the Holy Spirit. As long as we ask and have Jesus in our hearts with the Holy Spirit, we will never thirst again for the Holy Spirit because it will dwell inside of us. So let us pray. Gracious and almighty Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us. Help us, Lord, to remember all we have to do is ask for you to come into our heart, and we will never thirst again for the Holy Spirit as it will dwell inside of us. Be with us throughout this week that we can continue to do your works. In your name we pray. Amen. One, two, three. Have a great week! Good job. I lost my mask. <laughs> so you thought I was going to spill water everywhere, didn't you? That's why I turned it upside down. <laughs> That's pretty slick, I'm not going to lie. Why do you do that? Wow. You can do anything with Christ with you. <laughs> so after this, uh, we're, I'm going to play a song before we, uh, before I preach. I'm not going <coughs> to sing, but uh, I, I put a video clip of this up on Facebook a few days ago. But it had been a year since I recorded it in the first place, but it was just a... Uh, Arrangement of a couple of hymns I did, and a couple of folks said, hey, we should play that on Sunday. So I thought, well, okay, I'll play it this morning. So, um, But it's a song called Hymn of Promise, and a song Standing on the Promises. Most of you know the second one. But I got a little funny with the rhythms, but it's, it's a cool thing. So I hope you guys enjoy.
It's good to have music. couple of phrases. Elizabeth starts a new long-term sub job in Tench tomorrow. Okay. Uh, she'll be working uh, special education focusing on autism. And more importantly, she said yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you want to elaborate on that announcement? Or do you want to do <laughs> October, th October 3rd. We're October still nailing down some other things. That is exciting. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, the camera is so secondary in the people in the room. But... <laughs> 
<laughs> feels a little bit like what Paul really does kind of do in parts of this passage. I mean, he's talked many times about how to live, God's gift of grace, the gift of Jesus, and, and it's very easy to get on board with all of that. You know, man, yeah, we're, we are right there. You know, we should be. We should be on board with those parts. But then Paul hits, you know, those few verses right after that, and he seems to be starting to meddle. And so hang on for that. That's kind of part two and a half as the sermon goes along. For time and time again, how to treat people, but this is going to force us to ask the question, what happens when I have been wronged by someone else? Okay, yeah. You were all smiling and laughing until I got there, and you're like, oh, oh let's talk about that. I understand. This, is a, this is, has some tough moments, but it's got important things in here that we want to cover. So what happens when I'm wronged by someone else? How do I treat them then? And does the Bible really say what so many people think it does about that? The answer is probably yes, but with some nuances. So we'll dive into this here. Romans chapter 12, and we're going to pick up in verse 9. Romans 12, beginning at verse 9, and we will read all the way down through the end of the chapter, which is just 12 verses, so it's not, it's not terribly long. All right, Romans 12, starting at verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Lord, as we dive in here this morning, Lord, help us to remember what you have called us to be, Lord, and that is so different than sometimes what the culture says we ought to be, how we should treat people and what we should do when we think we've been done wrong and all of that. Lord, show us and, and Lord, illuminate this word for us this morning and we ask it in Christ's name. Fix that microphone. It was interesting how that just fell on the middle of the room. I love the uh, very first words of this passage. It says, Let love be genuine. Have you ever been around somebody who was, you know, doing some things, maybe saying some things that could have been and probably should have been loving actions, but you know they weren't really genuine about it? There wasn't anything real behind what they were doing. You've been there before? Yeah. How did you feel when that happened? Silent. Okay. Um, <laughs> not happy. Yeah, not happy. You saw through it, didn't you? I mean, did you catch it pretty quickly that, you know, there's nothing real behind whatever overtures are being made here? Sure. And when love is not genuine, when it's not real, then it is obvious to others that it isn't. And Paul is, is addressing the Roman church here. Now, now know that the Roman church, the church at all at this point, is like less than 100 years old. So for us, a lot of this stuff that we're reading here, we think, okay, yeah, we know that. You know, treat people good and love one another and those things. Sure, that was totally countercultural to the people Paul was writing to. And it's a brand new idea for them. And do you know how some things kind of never change or some things at least come full circle? You know, thinking of other people first and treating everybody well, even when they've done you wrong and all that, it's kind of back to being countercultural, I think, these days. So we we'll let love be genuine. Because here's the other thing. This is a real tragic thing, okay? He's writing this to the church. 
talking about the church itself. You know, when we do not have real, genuine love, not just for each other in this building, but for other people who maybe aren't here yet, they can tell. People who are watching us can tell that that love is not real. There's nothing actual behind that. And so if they look at us and see us going through emotions or see us being real disingenuous in our loving kind of actions, then they might say, you know, they go to church, but there's really nothing different about them. Mm -hmm. I don't need that. I don't need, I don't need Jesus. I'm, I'm a good person. Whatever. They see no change. They see no difference. And that is tragic. So let love be real. Let it be genuine. Don't force yourself through emotions. The rest of this opening paragraph is other instructions and admonitions, if you will. I really think I just put that word in the sermon because I like it. Uh, <laughs> my vocabulary nerd self, sometimes I look at my notes and I'm going, I would never even say that in real life. I like big words. Um, other instructions and admonitions, if you will. But it is interesting. These come in short groups, and, and this is a very, very true point, that when you see things grouped together in Scripture, especially if you see it happen two or three times, really take notice of those things, because it's usually a reason for that. And so coming up on verse 11, and we have three life things that are thrown right at us in a little sequence. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, and serve the Lord. A lot of times these are in little clusters of two or three, like quick hits of advice, but they need to be kind of looked at and unpacked a little bit. So don't be slothful in zeal. In other words, don't be lazy about your faith. That's easy to do. It happens to all of us. Don't be lazy about your faith. Be zealous. Be active in pursuing things of faith. That doesn't mean you don't pursue other things. I mean, hello, I'm a pastor who collects old typewriters. I, like, I have to track these things down. Okay? You, know, you can spend time doing other things. But you know, be zealous in your faith, too. To be fervent in the spirit is to spend time in prayer. Spend time in prayer. Spend time. You see what I'm getting at? How many, you don't have to raise your hands. I don't, I don't want you to raise your hands. But just think about this question. How many of you, the, is it the, the, the most prayer you've done in a day in the last week? That's been to take two minutes and throw something up to God and basically say, okay, amen, thanks, see you later. <laughs> been there? You don't have to nod at me, you don't have to raise your hand, just think about it. Because I know that happens to us often because it happens to me often. I have to make effort to block off some time to go spend with God. Now, I'm not telling you to block off an hour a day or two hours a day. Or you hear some of, I mean, you'll read stories of, some of these old saints and hymn writers and people like that who spend like six hours a day on their faces. I'm not asking you to do that. I think that God called those people specifically to ministries of prayer like that. What I am saying, what I think Paul is saying, is when we're being fervent in spirit, that we do spend time, some meaningful time with God, however long that is. And it may be five minutes today. But it's probably not going to only be five minutes every day. You might need to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes. And, and here's the other part, is that you don't do all the talking. Yeah, give your request to God, absolutely. So many places in the scripture it says, do that. So do it. But also spend time listening, because he will speak. It's probably not going to come booming through your ceiling. It's more of a still, small voice that lives right about here. But he'll, he'll talk. So be there to listen for that. Be fervent in that prayer. Cover your day-to-day -day life. In prayer, however long you have to spend, and I could fall down a whole sermon rabbit hole about prayer, but I know I've preached at least two or three of them in the last year, so you're not getting a total rehash, you guys are safe. <laughs> but in doing those things, that's the first part, is that you, you know, you have to don't be slothful, be fervent in spirit, and serve the Lord. If you're doing those first two things, then the outgrowth of that is going to be that your life is in service to God, that you're serving the Lord in what you do. But make sure that you serve him first and not yourself. Mm -hmm. Also make sure that you serve him first and not other people. That's right. Now, you can have a life that is full of service to other people, and you should. But your primary service should be God. And from that devotion, the service to other people will sort of be an outgrowth of that. But make sure God is primary. Don't get so lost in the shuffle that you forget about the other. 
Daddy's quoting this. I don't know who said it to him, but I think it's a great quote, so I'm going to use it. Don't get so caught up working for the kingdom that you forget about the king. That's right. That make sense? Mm -hmm. Serve the Lord first. The other side will be broke up. So you're doing those things. Well, then you come right up to another group of three here in the scripture. So you have rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. We sort of have a, a theme for our third point here. You can be fervent and be constant in prayer. Rejoicing in the hope of Christ, because he's a hope like no other. And you, you know that most of you, I'm sure. I think all of you do. I don't see anybody who I think is, is uh, not living a life for Christ, but it's, it's important to remember sometimes. We need to rejoice in hope, even when it's hard to do. That was an entire sermon a couple of weeks ago. And it's an important thing to remember. Rejoice at all times. Be patient in tribulation. That's the hardest one. Things are hard. Hang in there. Because you're not there alone. I think that's, that, that's the most important reminder here is that, you know, where can I go from your presence, says the psalmist. When I, if I climb to the heights of the heavens, you're there. If I descend into the dead, you're there too. And you're everywhere in between. That's the kind of hope we have. So be patient in tribulation because you're not alone in it. Hang on through that. And, and then this group closes virtually the same as the last one. Be constant in prayer. Now, I can read you those things and say the things I just said to you and end the sermon right there. And most people would be like, absolutely, I'm on board with that. I've got that one. I'm good. And then we start the next sentence, and it says, bless those who persecute you. And you're like, well, Paul has gone right back to that meddling thing <laughs> we talked about at the beginning. Now, now, wait a minute. You don't know what so-and-so did to me here. Now, hang on there a second, Pastor. You don't understand how I was treated. Right? This last one was a real one, but it wasn't anybody in either of these churches, okay? I would never tell a name or anything else like that. But this is, they said, now wait a minute. Pastor, no, that's not fair. I've got a right <laughs> to be mad. <laughs> to do these things I'm doing or act the way I am because I just can't stand it. So and so did such and such. Have you heard these before? Mm -hmm. We don't do that. Okay, that should have been an amen moment, so we're going to say it again. Um, hear me here, quite seriously, and hear me well. All of those things about I've got a right, or you don't understand, whatever. We don't do that. Amen. 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 That is not how Christians act. Mm -hmm. Let's just get right down to it. We don't act that way. If Christ is in you, you won't act that way. You are acting that way. There's an altar here. Might as well come down. Paul doesn't even stop there. I mean, he could have, and that would have been it, but he didn't. Touches on some other things, and then goes right back to how we treat our enemies. It's like he can't leave this point alone that feels like he's meddling or stepping on all of our toes. But first, the other important things, because these are these are very important. We need them to go over them quickly. Verse 15 tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Paul's getting at that word that we keep coming back to so often, and it's this, it's community. We walk with each other, rejoicing when other people are rejoicing, weeping with them, coming alongside them when things are hard, holding them up, you know, and lifting them up even higher when things are great, coming together in community. You know, for so many people, that's what they're seeking in life in general, especially for people outside the church. That's what they're seeking, and they're not finding it here finding it in other places, and that's a problem. I mean, people who have fallen into drugs, and it's happened to some great people, but you don't think they just woke up and went, you know, I think I'll try drugs today. Do you? No. They're sort of at the end of a lot of other things, and they find a group of people who will welcome them with no strings attached. They bring them in. Well, then they find the community there, and they fall into that community. And they stay there. And sometimes they are lost there. We have to be, as the church, a community that welcomes people in. We've got to be. We've got to be. Verse 16 tells us, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. And I'm going to tag a word on here that we all need to remember. All of the lowly. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul 
is saying. I'm not adding something to the scripture. He just didn't write that word down, but it's in all the grammar, so hear it correctly. All of the load. We don't get to say that person has too many tattoos or I don't like their blue hair or whatever. All of the load. Rejoice with them in good times. Weep with them in their trial and tragedy. Walk with them through their life. Not just accepting them when everything is okay. That's a tough one too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the beautiful part about that though, is that Jesus accepted us when everything was not okay. Right? That's the whole reason we needed Jesus. It's the whole reason everybody needs Jesus. So associate with the lowly. Because here's the best part. Okay? Jesus called for all who are weary and heavy laden. I think it's been all of us at one time or another because that's why we came. That's people who don't have it yet. I'll tell you what he did not say. He did not say, come to me, all of you who have it together all the time and we'll leave the others to fend for themselves. Well, I'm glad he didn't either because I sure don't have it together all the time. You know? You should, you should watch the sermon writing process sometime. Sometime you guys should just come hang out with me on about Tuesday while I'm trying to figure out what I might talk about. It's, it's insane. I don't even have it together like that. Uh, and I do this every week. You know, you think this would get better. It hasn't. It's a frenetic little crazy process. I don't even have it together all the time. I'm glad he didn't say that. What he said was all who are weary and heavy laden. So then we come to Christ, and now he says to us, associate with the lowly. Well, that's everything. We need each other. And that's beyond sort of all of that, is that we need each other. When we suffer a loss, we walk with each other through it. Which, by the way, both these churches have done so beautifully over the last week or so. You know, to come alongside and to help me out, to help me out a lot. I'm, as a pastor, I've been awful proud of you. Uh, but I mean, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. Come alongside and rejoice with each other. When we couldn't meet in here, did you long to meet in here? Did you miss being in here? Why? I mean, of course you did, but why? And you can't tell me it's because you like that light fixture right there so much that that's why you had to come back and build it, right? There's the other people who are being with each other. Yeah. It's that community together. And that's the sort of community we're talking about. And it's not just because we like each other and such, although that's a, I'm glad we do. I feel like we all do. But it runs deeper than that. It's community because we're all part of the one body of Christ. Yeah. Knit together as only he can do. I mean, it's like I said last week. You know, there's one body of Christ, and you're in it. And we're in it. And we're in it together. So that's awesome. You know, we're... we're those are, those are great things to remember. And be encouraged by that last part, because now we're at verse 17 and we're back to the hard part. <laughs> I'm just going to pick up and read the last few verses of this passage. Check it out. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceful, peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is true. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Have you ever seen the movie True Grit before? Yeah? Most of you? Some of you know? Okay. Um, it's one of my favorite movies. And both the old John Wayne one from 1969 and the remade one that came out in 2010. I love that movie. It's a fantastic movie. Uh, if you've never seen it, here's a brief story synopsis, okay? Uh, there's a girl named Maddie Ross. And Maddie is 14 years old. Maddie's father has been killed, and she knows who did it. It's a guy named Tom Chaney. And uh, so she seeks out a U.S. Marshal to go after Tom Chaney and his gang finds a guy named Reuben J. Cogburn, who's better known as Rooster Cogburn throughout all of this movie. And so she's hired Rooster to go after this guy that killed her dad. And we're talking out into the wilderness to go find this guy who killed her dad. Um, 
way out west, up in the mountains. It is a tough country, but he's going to track me. So she's hired him to do this. But then she insists that she go along on this trip, too. Because, you know, she started out, she's, she's kind of doing the right thing. She's gone to the wall, and she's going to have this taken care of that way. Now she insists that she's going to go. So they go, and they're tracking. In Tom Cheney, they find where he is. Now, Rooster and Maddie get separated. Maddie ends up face to face with the guy who murdered her father. And in this moment, she has decided that she is not waiting for the justice of the state. She is not waiting for perhaps God's vengeance. She just needs vengeance herself. And so she pulls out her, her gun and she shoots him and kills him. When she does, the recoil from the firing of that weapon throws her off balance as it comes back against her. It's, it's much too large a gun for her small frame. It knocks her backwards and into a pit that is way down into a cavern that opens up and she gets bit by a snake while she's in there. Now, I'm not saying that the writer of True Grit way back when had a biblical picture in mind, but I'm seeing a lot of this. Because listen, snakes have been picture of sin since the very beginning. And, I mean, the vengeance was not really hers to be had. She would have just given it to the proper authorities and left it with the people who could, should have taken care of it, then she would not have found herself where she did. But instead, she insisted on going. She took vengeance for herself and ended up poisoned. Because of it. This is a rattlesnake who did Almost killed her. She did not see it. She did live through it. I mean, I know it's a movie, but it's a very good illustration for what happens when we let the desire for vengeance build up inside of us. And if we take justice into our own hands, listen, even if we do that, we get what we think we want, we get what we think we need, it poisons us. It leads to grave danger. It's better to leave those things to the Lord, because Jesus says, or the Lord says, vengeance is mine. He didn't say vengeance is yours. Mine either. Let that stuff build up inside, and that starts to get in the way of your heart. It starts to get in the way of God being able to speak to your spirit and poison you. And then it, sometimes if you let it build up enough, you let it build up long enough, you're not even the person you were before it started. And not at the end of the old one, but at the end of the remake, we see an older Maddie Ross just for a second, and she's had to have her arm amputated below the elbow because of that bite. Now, if she would have stayed home not going after vengeance herself, that wouldn't happen. Sometimes vengeance eats at us and we are not who we used to be if we let it. That's right. I know most of us are not ready to go exact vengeance on somebody by chasing them to the Colorado wilderness and kill them. <laughs> but in whatever measure, letting anger build up inside when someone is wrong with us is not where we are to be as Christians. Repay evil with good. And in doing so, we heap burning coals on the heads of our enemies. And I used to love that passage when I was about 13 because I was like, yeah, I can do nice things and it'll, it'll hurt them, you know? It was some sort of like friendly vengeance. I don't, I don't know how you get there, but I just thought, man, burning coals on the heads of my enemies, that's awesome. That's, that's not what that means. It's not what that means. There's actually not one single consensus of what this phrase means. It was an idiom in that particular time, but there are three or four really good conjectures, and none of them mean what I have just said, by the way. But I'm going to share a couple of them with you because I think they're all important. They all kind of go together as to what Paul is really getting at here when he says, you know, you overcome evil with good, and in doing so, you're going to heat burning coals on the heads of the people who have wronged you. Now, the, one of the first ones is this, is that, that your good deed might make them feel shame for what they've done. You know, give them a little perspective here. But the, the next couple, which are really similar, so I'm just kind of roll them into one, but it says that, you know, the burning coals is figurative for a burning feeling they feel in their heart, not just that they feel shame for what they did, but that drives them to repentance. So, so less of a, I feel bad about that, and more of a, Sorrowful, I would rather make this right. Okay. But the third one is really is really my favorite um, because I think it's the most interesting one. And so that in this one, burning coals would come from your heart. They'd come from your fireplace. 
as they would come from your fireplace for your enemy's fireplace. So in the cold of winter, it would be impossible to survive without heat. And I know some of you are already going away, and we're in the Middle East here around the belts, and there's a lot of desert space here. Yes, there is. Have you ever looked up what happens to the desert at night? Temperature drops off massively. You can be up around 100 degrees during the day and be below freezing at night in some places in the desert. So, and in the winter, I mean, that's especially bad. In the winter, everywhere, nobody wants to be without heat because not just isn't unpleasant, it can be dangerous. And so imagine then that your enemy has come to your house, knocked on your door in the winter, not to do something terrible to you, but because he's at a loss and has nowhere else to go has no coals on his fire. Well, if you heat burning coals on his head, you, what that means is that you would get coals from your fireplace that were hot and put them in a container that they would have carried, like they carried so many other things, right here. If you heat it up, it means you didn't, you didn't skip. You gave them enough that by the time they got home, at least some of it is still hot so that he can start a fire, so that he doesn't freeze so that he stays alive. Even burning coals on their head is giving them life when things should kill them. Puts a little different perspective on that passage, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Your kindness in response to being mistreated, your kindness led by a godly heart and life can sow life by God moving through you in your kindness in a place where there wasn't it. See that? It opened the door for God to do some incredible things. You can sow life into darkness, life into death, and respond to being mistreated in a godly way. I mean, ultimately we land at the very end of this, overcome evil with good. Not in a vengeful way, but in a way that turns their hearts to repentance. And this goes right back to where we started. What was the first phrase we said in here? Let love be genuine. Mm -hmm. It goes right back to that. Whether the other person is a friend or an enemy, whether they've done right or wrong by you, whatever it is, let love be genuine. Be fervent in prayer in your life. Leave the vengeance to God and love your enemies. Because sowing life where there should be death and darkness heaping burning coals on their heads so they don't freeze them in the winter of the darkness. Might be the thing that brings them into this community, the body of Christ. So be that community. Be who God called us to be, to all people at all times. Doing this will bring life, sometimes in the places where you least expect it.
forget, if you need one of the communion kits for next Sunday, um, we have them. If you haven't got them over here, uh, one has been made up for everybody who was in the directory. If you happen to not be in the directory, we have a couple of extras, and we can make some more if you need to. They're reusable, um, too. They, they are reusable, so if you got them before, please still have them. Uh, but if you don't, we can, we can get that worked out. Um, I think that's it. Make sure you bring them with you next Sunday, because we're going to have to meet next Sunday. There will be announcements about that throughout the week. Um, with that, I think we'll close the presentation. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in you that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.